Um, with regards to the development of clinical pathways, we started doing them at Dana-Farber four years ago. We uh, have used them in each disease center to make sure that we're approaching treatment in a uh, homo more homogenous fashion, that we prioritize what treatment to use in a given situation, and all of the major disease sites at our institution use pathways. When pathways were developed, um, there were several uh, goals of having them. One was so that as new treatments came out, we could discuss as a group how to incorporate these new treatments. And it's very rapid in the field of oncology now, as I'm sure many people know. We had, I think the last six weeks, three new drugs approved in breast cancer. So being able to meet and decide where are we gonna use those, how are we gonna use those, what line of therapy, what toxicities are important to point out. So, so efficacy is still very high on the list. Obviously, if the drug is not very effective, we're probably not going to add it to our pathways, but if it's an effective in a given system, um, we will certainly try to add it. Um, toxicity is always included as well, so it's, it's not, it's hard to say that one's important, not the other. They're, bo they're both important. Um, so if the drug's efficacious, we'll look at toxicity. If there's different drugs in that same category, then that's where toxicity becomes even more important. Every time we, we discuss a new drug or review our pathways and decide whether to make, make changes. And then we also look at cost. I mean, we don't typically know the cost until the drug is actually out there in the market, but we always talk about that as well as one of the considerations. From an IT standpoint, early on, the pathways were in a separate app, which so uh, providers had to go in and click a separate app, open that up. You could do it from your schedule, so you didn't have to put in the patient, you know, date of birth or medical record number, but you still had to plug in patient stage, the biomarkers, the oncotype. It was a little more tedious, if you will. So the, the more recent um, platform we've been using for the last year, um, you don't have to put any of that in. It's, it's actually embedded into the electronic medical record, which has made it much easier to use. They're just on the menu, there's a Dana-Farber Pathways uh, category you can click that opens Pathways right up within the medical record. The patient's information is in there, and you don't have to enter all that data. You can just go to what category is, is appropriate. So if this is an adjuvant, stage two, HER2 positive breast cancer, you go to that section, but you don't have to click there and enter the T and N and M stage and that sort of thing. So I think that's made it a lot easier to use. People used to complain appropriately about the clicks and all the data entry involved. So we, we've taken that away. Um, so we try to make it more kind of upfront, user-friendly, right there, easy to use. We also added a carrot because we do want to make sure there's a reward for people going in to use pathways besides the information there. And that is the consent form prints from it. So once you finalized your, your um, pathway that you've chosen, the consent form is populated. You can edit it if you'd like. You print it. It saves you from having to do that in a whole other system. So that is probably what providers have liked the best about it, is if they go through this fairly quick process, they come out at the end with a very nice consent form already for them. How we link in subtypes and markers is that the pathways in general are based on subtypes. So not only stage, this is early stage breast cancer or local recurrent or metastatic, those are three different categories. But within each category, it'll be organized by hormone receptor positive or two negative, or triple negative or HER2 positive. So each, each category has those, those three biomarker subsets. And within a biomarker subset for the non-metastatic patients will be different stages. We'll treat stage one HER2 positive differently than stage two or three HER2 positive. So that's the, the section you choose is really dictated by the stage and the biomarker. And then in a given section, if there's other appropriate markers that are important for a decision, there, there will be notations about that. Either a reminder note, this is a good time to check this, this particular marker, or this treatment is only effective in the presence of a marker. So for instance, if it's metastatic triple negative breast cancer, we, we will state that it needs to, the tumor needs to be pdl one positive in order for the atezolizumab and nanoalbumin bound paclitaxel to be an option. If it's pdl one negative, then there's a different branch for that, so to speak. Um, or for metastatic ER positive breast cancer, if patients are considering use of a PI3K inhibitor, then the tumor needs to, such as alpha lysib, the tumor needs to have a PI3K mutation. Um, less common, we, we mentioned these, we don't have a separate branch because it doesn't come up very much, but for breast cancers that have um, microsatellite instability that are MSA high, then pembrolizumab is a, is a treatment option. We just don't see it very often in breast cancer, so we have it as a no rather than a, a separate branch of treatment.
the process for getting approval to use an agent not on the pathway is not actually any different than it was before pathways pathways isn't part we so far don't link that to approval if pay providers are always able to go off pathway to use a treatment so last week for instance i started a patient with metastatic her two positive breast cancer on Aribulin, Herceptin, and Pertuzumab. The one we have that's already approved a, a regimen is just Aribulin and, and, and uh, Prestuzumab. So there's nothing that prevents a provider except for choosing something off pathway, writing it what they want to use. We have a separate mechanism where we have a drawization group that you email to say, I'd like to use this, this is why, here's the reference, and then that process kind of happens in parallel. But in Pathways itself, the way we have it set up, you can go off pathway. Our goal is a good 80% you know, or above of the time people are on pathway, just meaning that we've covered the treatment options well, but if someone is off pathway 30 or 40% of the time in a given month, there's no, there's no penalty for that. They don't get called out for it. We do look at it. If, the, if providers are going off pathway a lot, then maybe our pathways aren't what they need to be. We need to relook at that and decide, do we need to modify things and, and make it so our pathways are reflecting what, what we're actually doing more. So over the last year, since we've changed platforms, we work with a software company called Philips. They provide the, the actual software um, IT platform. And all the content is, is developed at Dana Farber. Um, so, and, and yes, we do look at things like NCSN guidelines, but honestly, after the fact, it's never part of our actual process of, are we gonna use this drug and where are we gonna use it? And what are the, what's the information we're gonna put in when we add it to our pathway? So it's. The content is driven by each disease center. So in the breast oncology group, we have a minimum of three meetings a year when we'll look at our pathway usage and off pathway rate and what are we actually doing and what do we need to change. But we'll also look at new drugs as they came out as they come out and figure out where they should be added in the pathway. We do have ways we can look at uh, some patient characteristics and preferences and pathways, although there's more work to be done and we would like to expand that going forward. For instance, in the adjuvant pathway regimens, we always give options for non-anthracycline um, regimens and options for non-taxing uh, regimens for patients that have contraindications to cardiotoxic agents or have pre-existing neuropathy. And we will specifically also state if a regimen has a toxicity that the providers and patients need to be aware of, such as we just approved and put on our pathway trastuzumab deruxtecan, and we very boldly mentioned the interstitial pneumonitis since that is not uncommon and it can be fatal and that needs to be certainly considered strongly when you're considering that pathway. What we haven't been able to do yet but we do want to do is have it a little bit more clickable. You could get especially in that advanced breast cancer setting where you know toxicity is so important. Efficacy is important but so is quality of life and minimizing toxicity for as you know as much as you can be able to click off this patient really doesn't want to lose their hair. What what are my best options or doesn't want to lose their hair as, as long as possible, or this person already has pretty bad neuropathy from a pri prior treatment, I want to get rid of anything on the list that might worsen their neuropathy. So we've, we've talked about it, we just don't yet have the IT ability yet to kind of prioritize those sort of things and then sort a list based on toxicities, but, but that's certainly high in everyone's mind to be able to do so.